It is uh, very difficult for those who live in a democracy to understand a specific conditions of a totalitarian system, being manipulated, being educated in a specific way. In the 30s, as a young boy in my high school, I did believe in all what our propaganda said. I did believe in the rightness of Hitler's policy. And even all these successes of Hitler convinced myself, I was then a young boy, this is the right way, and he does everything for the Germans, for the greatness and for the honor of the Germans. And if you were marching in the rally, or let's say in the Hitler youth, you had this absolutely feeling undefeated. There is nobody else who can be compared with us. He was somebody, I must say this. Right? And then he could, uh, he could, uh, verführen, the Jews, yeah? Was, was is verführen? Seduce, seduce. He was, uh, he could really seduce the people and he had uh, uh, some sort of influence I cannot describe. He was a phenomenon. When he started speaking, he mesmerized, especially large audiences. He, he was a mass communicator and he did it by sort of easing in into the speech with a deep, sonorous voice that uh, was almost seductive. And on a crescendo, kept on going, intensifying until in the end he was practically screaming. Not only practically, he was. Dieses deutsche Volk, ein Vorführung durch eigene Arbeit, durch eigenen Fleiß, eigene Entschlossenheit, eigenen Trotz, eigene Beharrlichkeit, dann werden wir wieder den Vorstein, genau wie die Täter einst auch Deutschland nicht geschenkt erhielten, sondern selbst nicht schaffen mussten. Even today, I must say, if one see uh, the documentary film on the rally in Nuremberg, marching thousands of people, and then one cry, Heil mein Führer, this is something give you the strength, a strong, absolutely unbelievable, fascinating feeling. Well, what kind of, the, of German, you know, what, what, what the greatness of Germany, what kind of discipline the Germans have. General Johannes Steinhoff is a leading Luftwaffe ace who later becomes head of NATO's military committee. His face shows the scars of combat. Please bear in mind, Hitler came to power the very moment radio was invented. And Hitler was using radio in a very clever way. After one year, after Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, we had the so-called People's Receiver. This was a small radio. Each family was having this in their kitchen. So the Führer could talk on a daily basis to his people. He was using, for the first time, the media in a very clever way, using radio to in an extensive way. So the uh, medium radio, thank God he didn't have television, was a tremendous tool in his hands. With the country behind him, Hitler vows to reclaim the territories lost to Germany in World War I. In 1936, he sends German troops into the Rhineland, an area barred to German forces by the Versailles Treaty. Hitler's generals are afraid that the French, with a much bigger and better equipped army, will fight. Hitler said, we're going to march into the Rhineland, and we marched into the Rhineland, and France did not move. Even if Germany at that time uh, had so few troops that what they did that at night they quietly marched back over the same Rhine bridges in order to march in with music and bands the next day in the morning. 
And they kept that repeating that and pretending that they had enormous numbers of troops there. It worked. They had the strength to, to, to uh, stop Hitler before he, he had started a, a major European war. If the Allies had done something at that time, uh, it, it probably would have been the end of Hitler. Next, Hitler marches into Austria and then into Czechoslovakia. Britain and France protest, but again do nothing. Hitler has pulled off a series of brilliant bluffs against larger and stronger powers who lack the will to confront him. General J. A. Graf von Kielmansegg, later to become commander of NATO's land forces in Central Europe, was a young German officer at the time. The whole German people, he was a great man. Please don't forget about Hitler. One thing, he had given back to Germany, more or less, all what Germany had lost in the Treaty of Versailles without any shoot, without any war, in peace. He had done away in two years seven million unemployed people. 1939, another coup. Hitler negotiates a treaty of alliance with the Soviet Union. Hitler and Stalin agree to invade and divide Poland. Russia will be allowed to swallow the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Now that Hitler's back is secure, he takes a giant step. On the 1st of September, ignoring warnings from an aroused Britain and France, he attacks Poland with masses of tanks led by screaming Stuka dive bombers. It is a new form of warfare, Blitzkrieg. The Polish horse cavalry valiantly and briefly charged the tanks with their lances. The spectacle is too much for Britain and France. They declare war on Germany. Hitler is stunned. His foreign minister, von Ribbentrop, had assured him they would once more stand aside. He didn't intend to start World War II. He didn't even intend to start a world, a European war. He proposed to have a nice little private war with Poland. Uh, and that's where he made his mistake. It is Hitler's first major miscalculation. General Adolf Galland remembers it well. Galland became head of the Luftwaffe's fighter arm at the age of 30. The German forces were only five, six years from their birth. And the Air Force was not ready for a battle at all. And his belief was that France and Great Britain would never attack Germany, having the Russian as uh, allied. He was confirmed in this opinion by our foreign minister, von Ribbentrop. He has a great, great responsibility for the outbreak of this World War II. And I know early in 44, after the invasion, I told Göring, the war is absolutely lost, completely. He said to me, here is my car, drive over to Ribbentrop and tell him the same. And I did. And um, Ribbentrop, of course, did find some excuse that he didn't make the decision to attack Poland. Going uh, was against this attack. Absolutely. He saw the risk. Ignoring the risk, Hitler orders his generals to plan an attack against France. Anyone who thinks of the Germans as unfailingly efficient should study what happened here. At first, his generals decide on the same strategy they used in World War I. An army group in the north will slice across the Netherlands and Belgium and into France. Other army groups in the center and south will exert pressure. One maverick general, Eric von Munstein, objects. He says it's exactly what the Allies expect. It will bog down in trench warfare. Munstein wants to put the main thrust in the center, mass the tanks there, and drive through the supposedly impenetrable Ardenne forest to outflank the Allies. Munstein is overruled and sent away. But by sheer chance, 
Hitler invites a group of officers to lunch, and Munstein is among them. He manages to present his plan directly to Hitler. Hitler accepts it. Now it is spring. The attack order has been postponed 29 times. It is time to find out if the radical new battle plan will work. As we will see, it does more than that. It writes a whole new chapter in the history of warfare. It finally happens on May 10th, 1940. German armored divisions smash across the border. Tanks are no longer used to support the infantry. They are instead massed to strike swiftly on their own. As they did in Poland, Stuka dive bombers blast a path for the tanks. The British and French do exactly what Manstein had predicted. They blindly march up into Belgium, expecting the big attack to come that way. Instead, the attack slices rapidly beneath and past them. Young Kilmanseg is with the 1st Panzer Division, led by the legendary Heinz Guderian. The French uh, chief of general staff, uh, General, general Gamelin, did not believe that it was possible to cross the Ardennes with so many tanks, with so many divisions, because if you have seen the Ardennes, you, you would say he was, not, uh, he was right. Were you surprised at how fast it went? Uh, surprised about what? The quickness. We not, no. Uh, this we knew before. If he could go through, then uh, uh, the quickness would be there. The French were surprised. <laughs> but Hitler worries about possible flank attacks on the extended German columns. General Holder, head of the general staff, says the Führer raves and bellows that things are moving too fast. Manstein says later that Hitler is bold in planning, but timid in execution. Meanwhile, the German armor races all the way across France in an incredible 10 days. The two main battle groups close in on the town of Dunkirk from north and south. More than 300,000 Allied soldiers, the entire British expeditionary force, are penned up with their backs to the beach. An enormous victory is in sight. If the entire British army is captured, Britain will be defenseless. And then something incredible happens. Hitler orders his tanks to halt. Not only to halt, but to pull back. General Guderian, the panzer leader, says, we were speechless. We were angry is not the real expression, much more, uh, much more than angry and were d disappointed. And we saw the success. We saw the, 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 the possibility to catch the British army. It was a very serious mistake. A serious mistake that changed the course of the war. Why did Hitler make it? Several reasons. General von Rundstedt, commander of the Central Army Group, is worried about a possible counterattack. But Field Marshal Hermann Goering says that the tanks won't be needed. He'll destroy the British Army with his National Socialist Luftwaffe. The Stuka dive bombers take to the air to do it, and the Luftwaffe's fighters rise to cover them. The fighters of the British Royal Air Force swarm to the scene to protect the soldiers on the beach. A ragtag fleet of big and little boats sets out from the English coast to rescue the stranded soldiers. The German Messerschmitts are unable to protect the slow-diving Stukas from the fast British Spitfires and Hurricanes. The Stukas take terrible losses and, for the first time, the Luftwaffe fails. So this task to prohibit the escape was a task that could not be fulfilled at all. And Goering did overestimate his possibilities with this Luftwaffe. As a result, the British army and many French troops escape, leaving their weapons behind. Some call the evacuation a great victory. British wing commander Geoffrey Page, now retired, disagrees. It wasn't, in fact. It was a victorious retirement. Uh, but we were beaten and there was no question. Hermann Goering surveys the littered beach with his deputy, General Erhard Milch. Milch says there is no time to waste. An invasion of Great Britain must begin without delay. 
His plan is daring but simple. Make a quick airborne attack on Britain. Paratroops and gliders will drop on the southeastern coast of England and seize key airfields where the German fighters can land and refuel. Shuttles of Junker transports will bring in five divisions of soldiers. They will fan out into the countryside and head for London to seize the government. Goering and Milch take the plan to Hitler, but Hitler rejects it, some say out of respect for the British. I would not say respect. One of his main ideas was, in this time, to divide the world between Great Britain and Germany. And so, so he would, as is shown, he would not do too much harm to the British. I had the occasion to talk to him without any other company. And I told him we will have the opportunity to attack London when London is covered by fog, then we can fly with everything we have available, even with the Junker 52, like we did in Warsaw. And he said, stop it, stop it. I don't want to hear this. The, the whole attack on England is against my opinion, against my willing. I would like, to, I could stop it. The English population is of such high class and they are so similar to the Germans that I hate to fight England. Whatever the reason, Hitler drags his heels at fighting England and loses his golden chance. Could Germany really have taken England? The German aces are reluctant to speculate. Sir Christopher Foxley Norris, retired Air Chief Marshal of the RAF, is not. I am fairly certain it would have worked. Uh, Mark you once giving the opinion of a very young and ignorant man at the time, but uh, one became older and wiser, and all the indications are that it would have worked. It would have been a pretty puny and unsupported sort of attack, but nothing like as puny and unsupported as we were. We had nothing at all. I've had friends who were given the job of defending two miles of coastline with one World War I artillery piece. Um, we had nothing. But if they'd just gone roaring straight ahead, your Errol Flynn tactic, I think it would have worked. Hitler addresses the Reichstag and makes what he calls a peace offer to the British. He sees no reason why the war should go on, he says. He is grieved at the sacrifices it will claim. But Prime Minister Winston Churchill answers that Britain will fight on until the already conquered European countries are free. Privately, Churchill tells Roosevelt that if Britain goes down, Hitler has a very good chance of conquering the world. Dismayed by Churchill's response, Hitler reluctantly orders a massive cross-channel invasion of England. The operation is called Sea Lion. The general staff says that it can take place only if the British Air Force, the RAF, is first destroyed by the Luftwaffe. Only then can the invasion barges be protected against the British Navy. Armies and navies will sit and wait while the air forces fight it out. It is called the Battle of Britain. Well, now the Germans are dive bombing a convoy out into the sea. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's one going down on its target now. One. No, he missed the ships. He hasn't hit a single ship. There are about ten ships in the convoy. And here they come. They come in absolute steep dive. You can see that bomb next to the even machine. You can hear the little rattle from machine gun bullets. That was a bomb, as you may imagine. There's another bomb dropping. Yes, it dropped over. Oh, they missed the convoy. No, they haven't hit the convoy in all this. What? Well, yes, oh, we just hit a Messerschmitt. Oh, that was beautiful. He's coming right down now. I think definitely that's what that first one him. He's going flat into the sea, and there he goes. Oh boy, I've never seen anything so good as this. The RAF fighters have really got these boys, Dave. After two months of the battle, both sides are near exhaustion. And I participated in the Battle of Britain as a commander of a squadron, flying to London back and forth a total of 68 times. I was shot down only once to the Battle of Britain. But looking back, the Battle of Britain was the toughest part of the war for me. Uh, it was a sportive fight between uh, 
young people of two nations being of the same making, same education, they looked alike, the British and we, sportive, very fair, very fair, but extremely tough. Sometimes they had to fly three times per day to London and back. And you always lost one or two of your units during each mission. Uh, some of the pilots couldn't stand it anymore. Some uh, became sick. They went behind their, the tail of the aircraft before takeoff and vomited. They were flying, came back, vomited again and became sick. They were desperately tired. People went to sleep when you were talking to them. There was one man who actually landed and um, his aircraft came to a stop and uh, the, he didn't get out and the ground crew assumed that uh, he'd been shot up so they ran across to him and he was asleep. He'd just gone to sleep. And even if they weren't asleep, they were incredibly nervy, very jumpy and the sound of a telephone particularly, which was what sent you off. Was, and remains, in my case, to this day, a frightening noise. When the telephone ran, rang, which was a direct line from the operational headquarters, we could be from sound sleep, we could be airborne in under two and a half minutes, running out to our aircraft, starting the engine and getting off. And quite often you'd be uh, half asleep and uh, you found yourself up in the air. And then as you climbed up, you could see these massive dots in the distance. One day, a mass of bombers shoots him down over the channel. He spends two years in the hospital and then volunteers for more combat. Why? I think to be 20 years of age, to be given a, a fast aeroplane and a smart uniform uh, and get paid $20 a week to do it, I mean, what more do you want? If I'd been the son of a rich man, I think I would have paid to be allowed to do it. By now, the Luftwaffe is nearing its goal of destroying the Royal Air Force, the necessary prelude to the massive cross-channel invasion of England. And then Hitler issues another halt order. The Luftwaffe will abandon its task of destroying the RAF and start hitting cities. The RAF is given a providential chance to recover. Another major mistake. Why did Hitler make it? During that period, the British ran a few raids on Berlin and a couple of other cities, but mainly Berlin, which so infuriated Hitler that he ordered re retaliatory attacks on British cities, London in particular, and uh, with that, he dissipated the concentrated effort of the, of the Luftwaffe and brought on increasingly heavy losses, which in the end resulted in the defeat of the Luftwaffe. And if they had persisted in a sensible strategy, uh, I think they would almost certainly have won. The odds were stacked very heavily on them from many points of view. And I, it's not an exaggeration, I think, to say we didn't win the Battle of Britain. They lost it.